Hi, my name is Norman Cohen. Um, for seven years, uh, my name was um, Anand Pergi. And um, the reason I'm doing this uh, is because um, of, the, of the documentary, the Netflix documentary, Wild Wild Country. Um, and uh, at first I saw it and I was very taken back by what I saw. I mean, I didn't really know that much of what was going on there. I was there basically for two days. And uh, I'm getting phone calls from friends of mine who see this and they want to know what's happened. And basically I think there's a question behind the question is like, did you have anything to do with that? And I just want to set the record clear. Also, I want to create distinctions between my experience in Pune 1, Pune 1, my experience in Sangam, which is a center I started in the south of France, and my short experience at, at the ranch, and then what I, what I think of, of, of what I saw in the, in the documentary. I'm sitting in my, my, my dining room. Uh, I've got Aaron down there who's, who's running the uh, camera, who's a professional photographer. Thank you, Aaron. And I've got my friend Jason, who's a stand-up comedian, who's actually sitting down right now. Uh, and uh, he's going to make sure that you don't get too heavy and significant about this whole thing. Thank you. Um, so let me start with kind of a short history of, 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 of my experience in Pune 1. Now again, I'm, I'm, I'm 77 years old right now, and um, I, my memory probably is not as good as it should be. And also, it's been pre pretty proven that, with, you know, that people's memories aren't really, aren't really their memory sometimes. So if I get facts wrong or if I get uh, some information wrong, uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to do the best I can. Um, so looking back at Pune 1, uh, I arrived in 1975, um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed what I experienced when I first went there. Um, it was a community of people that I really liked. Um, that was basically it. And for me, um, it wasn't so much about enlightenment for me. It was more about community. Um, I think my personal opinion from what, I, what I've seen and what I understand and what I know is that the whole idea of enlightenment is kind of fool's gold. Um, it, it's a, it, it's, it, to me, it's, like a, it's, a, it's a paradox that you know, if you seek enlightenment, then you can't get it because seeking is, is in the way because desire is in the way and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So desiring enlightenment is kind of like desiring a Cadillac or a beautiful woman or something like that. It just didn't make sense to me. And or as Bhagwan would say, it's a, it's a decatomy. Some of you might get that. Um, so, so I was really there, and I think I stayed there because of the community. Um, I had come from um, the human potential movement. Um, I, had been, I had come from humanistic psychology. Uh, and for me, the whole point of any kind of therapy is, is a meeting between people that wouldn't ordinarily happen. And a lot of it has to do with community. A lot of it has to do with, 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 with the connection with other human beings. So that, to me, what, was what Puna One was about. There was something else about it, too, and many of you who were there can relate to this. And I don't know what better word to use, but it was magical. It was, it was, it was uh, I know mysterious not with the right word, but it was magical. I think being in India, for me, was magical, and being in the ashram with Bhagawan was, being, was, was magical. Um, there are things that happened there that I couldn't rationally explain, and I'm not going to do it now. Um, I've had, I had experiences there were, that were extraordinary. Um, uh, you know, it was kind of like a, a, a kind of like a, a, an acid trip in a way, you know. Uh, and so, you know, you, know, you know, what I'm thinking right now is that, is that you know, I, I guess I want to get across um, the beauty of, of Pune 1. Um, Bhagwan was present uh, when I first got there. Um, I, could, I could go into Darshan. I would make an appointment with Mukta, who was a wonderful human being. Um, Lakshmi ran the ashram. Uh, she was one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, 
Diksha ran the kitchen and she ran the food operation. Again, one of my dearest friends. Um, we had extraordinary people there and I was, it was an honor to be there. It was an honor to be with them. It was an honor to be with Bhagwan. Um, I mean, I could tell story after story after story about how great it was, but I think many of you who were there can understand what I'm saying. It was a great experience. Um, and again, you know, um, I'm a rebel. I've always been a rebel. Many, many of you know that about me. Um, I've been kicked out of everything that I ever joined. I was also kicked out of the, <laughs> kicked out of my center in south of France, but we'll go to that later. You know, I was, you know, I was kicked out of my college fraternity. I was kicked out of the, uh, the army reserves. I almost got kicked out of uh, 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 the, the San Francisco Bar Association. Um, my father eventually kicked me out of the house, and, and I was eventually kicked out of the. Uh, out of my own center in south of France. So, again, you know, I, I was a rebel and I felt I was a rebel living in a rebel camp. Um, uh, I, I, I always felt like an outsider um, and I felt that about people I was with. We were a bunch of, I felt there were a bunch of outsiders. And to me, the people in Pune were beautiful. I mean, they really were beautiful. They were physically beautiful. Uh, uh, people would come and they would have this extraordinary transformation, I think, and you could see it. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking about when I was when I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this dear friend of mine. Uh, she was a model, beautiful model. She came to Pune, and she was this tall, beautiful, thin model. And I got to know her pretty well. She was a great lady. And so, as I got to know her, she got bigger and bigger and bigger. And she starts, you know, wearing wearing these 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 robes with no with no underwear, and she's flopping all over the place. And she just became bigger and let her hair grow out and all that kind of stuff. And I talked to her one day about it. She said, "Yeah, she's. I got sick and tired of being, you know, treated like a model, and you know, I have to watch everything I eat. And here I can be free." She was dancing, and she was, and she was m much more beautiful than she was when she started. And that's what happened to a lot of us. I mean, there was something about the place that brought out the inner beauty in people. And I know it might sound corny, but I think it was true. Also, compared to the ranch, let's, let's look at who actually ran the Puna operation. As I said, it was Lakshmi. Lakshmi was a wonderful human being. Uh, I, 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 have a, a, I had a strong, strong love for her. And I still do. Uh, and I was honored that, that she talked to me just before she died. And it was a, it was a very poignant moment for me. Oh, uh, sorry. And so, um, and then, and then Mukta, uh, also a, a wonderful human being. You know, she was thoughtful. She was kind. You know, I remember she gave me a birthday present one time of this book, and she wrote in it. And, and we were a family. It was a, it was a family feeling. You know, and we were all nuts, but they were good people, and we were great people. I mean, Tirtha, Tirtha had a lot to do with starting the groups and the, and 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 uh, um, getting me in the ashram to do groups and do rolfing. Um, there were just but but basically, it was I think it was run basically by three women. Uh, it was it was uh, it was as I say, Mukta, um, Lakshmi, and Diksha. And as far as I'm concerned, those three women are wonderful. Um, they I never felt that they had much ego in the way. They were there for the right reason. They came from love. They came from respect. They came from appreciation. They were funny. Um, they were. They were down-to-earth human beings, and it was just, as I say, it was an honor to be there with them. Um, so, as the ashram grew and more people came, um, Bhagwan started hiring managers. I think that's what he called them, managers. And I was in the group department. Uh, I was doing I was doing groups, and I was doing I was doing rolfing, and I was teaching rolfing, and I was teaching massage. But mainly, I was doing these groups. And um, uh, the people coming from all over the world. And so uh, there was a woman named Sushila who was running the group. And she was, first of all, she didn't know shit about management. And uh, I mean, you know, she was trying to, I guess she was trying to do the best she can, but I don't think she knew what she was doing. And so um, I got the sense that at that point that Bhagwan was starting to hire these women as managers of different departments. And it something felt wrong about that to me. I just, I just, it just didn't feel right. It wasn't like Lakshmi. It wasn't like Mukta. It wasn't like Diksha. And so what happened was this: is that um, I was, 
at the time I was doing some rolfing sessions because I was between groups. And I would come in at night and I would go to the, to the, um, um, the group department office, as I remember, and I would check in and find out what my schedule was for the next day. So I'm in the office and the woman that's helping me, forgot who it was, she was helping me in the office. She said, um, she said, your mother called today and that she's going to call again tomorrow at five, uh, Puna time. I said, okay. So I said, well, don't, don't schedule me for anything so I can be here at five for my mother's phone call. So I don't know what happened, but anyway, what came down was Sushila said to me, I, I don't know how it worked out, but anyway, Sushila said to me, she says, no, she says, you have to be, you have to work. You can't, you know, you, you can't be here. You have to go to work. You have to do your phone. And so, you know, I mean, I just basically told her, you know, <laughs> what I would tell anybody. I said, fuck you. And so, and so those of you who know me know that. And so, and so in the next couple of days, I was told to go back to the West. And at that point, I go, okay, you know, I'm still a disciple. I'm still with Bhagwan. Fuck, I'll go back to the West. And so I had an exit darshan with him. And so uh, at the exit darshan, I asked, I, he said, I told him I was going to Europe. And he, and so he said, anything to say or something? I said, yeah. I said, if I'm in Europe and I want to start a center, can I start a center? He says, yeah. So he gave me the name Sangam at that time, which means confluence. It's like rivers coming together, which I thought was a beautiful name. And he wrote it down, all that. So um, I had no money at the time. I was broke, like most of us. So I sold my watch, and I sold, I think, a knife I had. And people gave me money, and people gave me clothes because I was going in the winter time in Europe. And it was really cool because it was family. You know, they knew where I was going, so people would chip in and help me. And I had a, a, my girlfriend at the time. She she was she lived in uh, her family lived in London, so we flew into London, and I stayed with her. Her family, uh, who didn't, they didn't have much money, but they were kind to me and they helped me. And so um, I got up, I, I asked her to use the phone. I told her I would pay her back for all the phone calls. And I got up and I started phoning all the centers in Europe to book these groups I was going to do. Well, they all booked groups for me. And uh, uh, all of a sudden I was starting to work in Europe. Uh, I moved up to Amsterdam. Um, and my dear friend uh, Nikatana, uh, <laughs> he uh, he took me out to dinner one night, and he took me to uh, 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 a Spanish restaurant, and uh, I ordered this. I'll never forget. I ordered this fish, and I ordered, and he ordered a bottle of wine. And here, you know, coming back from India, I'm eating this delicious food. It was fantastic. And he looked at me and he said, "Pragit," he said this is what Europe's all about. <laughs> I go, yeah. <laughs> so, so I was enjoying myself and I was going around doing groups and I was getting paid a lot of money. I was being paid in cash. I had this, I had this, you know, nice, had this nice uh, German purse on, on me and I fill it full of cash, you know, and I stick it in a bank every once in a while. And I was, I was going around, I was seeing people that I liked and I was kind of collecting people with the idea that maybe I might start a center. At the same time, this is all going on. The, the, in fact, when I, before I left, there was all these rumors of going around the ashram about where the ashram was going to move. Okay. So about the same time, the ashram is moving. And I, I might get my dates mixed up. But So what I realized was that there were going to be people coming out of, of Pune 1, coming to Europe, and I would kind of grab the people I liked and wanted to be with and start another start a center in the south of France, which is a cool place, and, uh, you know, live the dream, so to speak. Bhagwan's teachings, you know, love, life, and laughter. Uh, so, so that's kind of what I did. And uh, I made a lot of money, and I, I, I stashed it in a bank, and with that money, I started the center in the south of France. I went to a small village called Toronc, um, in the Alt Maritime, about 55 kilometers above Nice and Caen. And uh, people started coming and it grew. And um, to make a long story short, uh, um, uh, the Sang Sangam, uh, once we were in operation, I had about, I think there were about 75 people there. Uh, and um, I basically ran the center. 
And what I what was good about it for me is that, and the same thing with my groups. And I'll try to explain this best I can. When I was in when I was in Pune One, I was leading groups. Everyone was there. We were all disciples, so I was a disciple too, obviously. So everything was about Bhagwan. It was like after the group was over, we said thank you, Bhagwan, or we started thank you, Bhagwan. It was like Bhagwan was in the room. We had that 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 metaphor where Bhagwan was in the room, which is great for a group leader because the best therapists are therapists are out of the way. Everybody ever says that. If you want to be a good therapist, get the fuck out of the way. Same thing with the teacher. Same thing with the businessman. Same thing as a father. You know, get the fuck out of the way. And so it was an, I was able to experience that because it was always Bhagwan. So it was a great gift in the sense of training me to be a better therapist. You know, I think better person, maybe, who knows. <laughs> and so when I start when I start the center, I had people, some of the old timers from Pune were there. Um, great group of people, amazing group of people. I started to sound like Trump. A great group of people. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Wonderful people. And so, <laughs> wonderful people. Was it? The absolute best. The best. Absolute yeah. best. Thank you. Anyway, so, so, um, so I, I ran the center as a disciple, which is a great, I mean, I later ran a business that was very successful coming from the same paradigm, basically. So it was a wonderful experience. And south of France was amazing. Okay, it was amazing. Um, we lived in a beautiful place. <laughs> we were eating really good food, um, drinking good wine, uh, and actually enjoying ourselves. And we did good work. We had, you know, we did groups. And I was building, I was building the center up. Uh, and more and more people came there. Um, we started buying more buildings. I named the buildings after people who had died in Pune. Um, I named one building after Bhagwan's father. I forgot his name now. Babaji, I think I, got, I forgot his name. We named um, one building after Dharna, uh, Nikatana's girlfriend who died. Um, we named one building after Vipassana, Vyogi's sister. Um, I forgot who else. So anyway, so we kept expanding, and I did a um, a, 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 a rolfing training down there. It brought a lot of money in. Um, uh, uh, Peritos was there, uh, you know, Jungian therapist. We, we did groups. Um, uh, we, we 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 had a we bought a hotel and a restaurant. Uh, we had the people coming up from the south of France for weekends, having having lunch at our place, <laughs> which didn't always work out too well. <laughs> One time, anyway, so it didn't work out too well, but it, it worked out okay. Um, so uh, so at, as we went on, um, all of a sudden, who shows up in Europe? But Susila. And Sushila is connected to the ranch. And from what I understand, it was kind of her job, I think, to collect money for the ranch, to go around Europe and collect money for the ranch. It took me a while to, to figure that out because I, it didn't make sense to me. But after a while, I figured it out that that's what she was up to. I remember one time she needed some money and I had, a, I had to go down to the bank, get some cash and actually fly up to Paris to give it to her. Um, so that was going on. Also, as we grew, I started seeing a possibility of really expanding. And um, I contacted, I forgot who I contacted, um, but I got permission from Bhagwan to start, uh, uh, to, to buy this, this huge piece of property there. It had, been a, um, it had been a retreat for Catholic nuns, and it was huge. It was like the main building was 350 rooms. And then there were outbuildings around there. So Bhagwan gave me the name of Villa de Rajneesh Neo Sanyasin Commune. It was on a huge piece of land and it was a beautiful structure. Um, and I was going to buy it from the city of Grasse, which is the closest city to where we were, uh, for a million dollars. And uh, I was going to negotiate with the, uh, with the mayor of Grasse. And the, the, the part of the negotiation would be that they would take that million dollars and put it into their hospital because I wanted us to have be known as a contribution to the community. 
And I already started selling parts of this to the Europeans who would come, the European sannyasins who would come. And I was going to sell, I was going to sell it off for $2 million. So we make a million dollar profit. And with that million dollars, we could fix it up and also, you know, it'd be a contribution to the, to the community. And it was working. And here's where it got sticky. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how the information got out. I assume that in my center, there were, there were some people who were uh, spies, I guess the best word, who were, contact, who were, who were in contact with, with the people that ran the ranch. I don't know for sure, but it seems that way. So what happens is Sushila comes down and she tells us that we're supposed to close down the center. We said, okay, it's part of the game. You know, we know the game. And, um, and at that time, there was a rich, there was a rich German sannyasin who was, was, sent, was wiring money down to the bank in grass to buy a large chunk of this piece of property. He wanted to support what I was doing. And it was a lot of money. It was like $350,000. And Sushila wanted that money for the ranch. And I go, well, no, you can't do that. I'm not going to cheat this man out of his money because you want money for the ranch. And at that point, I could kind of see the, the end was there. I mean, it was, it was, it was getting towards that point where uh, this is, it, I could see that, that this is not going to last too long. Now, I had been kicked out of Pune, and I was broke. And when I got to, to England, I, I had no money. And uh, I, so I had always, I always kept a stash, my own personal stash, in case this ever happened again. You know, once a mistake, twice a fool. So I had a stash in, in, uh, in, my, in my bank in grass. I knew, I knew the bank manager. Uh, was uh, was a credit Leone, and I think his name was Mr. Frattini. He was a great guy. He was one of my friends. And so he had this stash for me, and he knew what it was. And it was my own money. I earned it. I didn't steal it from anybody. And so when I got kicked out, I figured, well, I'll, you know, excuse me, when, when they closed the, the place down, um, I knew a lot of people were going to go to the ranch, but I, I didn't want to go to the ranch. I would figure I'll just, you know, that'd be the end. I'll go get my stash and split. So we all celebrated the closing of it, which is part of the deal with Bhagwan. You celebrate everything. We all got up and danced, and it was sad, but we did it anyway. And so uh, shortly thereafter, I get a call from someone at the ranch. I forgot who it was. And they said that Bhagwan wants you to keep the center open. I said, okay, cool. So we keep the center open. Then the next thing I get told is that I'm called, I think they use the word, I'm called to the ranch. I guess it was their first big celebration or some shit like that. So I figured, well, I better go. So imagine, we're coming from the south of France, okay? <laughs> we're living like, we're living big, we're living big. I mean, you know, we all got nice clothes, uh, you know, the first, the first Christmas we had, uh, Sangi Tom and I went down to, uh, to Nice and bought presents for everybody because I had a lot of money from, from all the groups I did. And we did, all these people, you know, who come back from India, we got them all new clothes and, and it was, you know, we dress well. We, I mean, we looked like French people. We didn't want to cause trouble, so we dressed like French people. We, we, um, we contributed to our community. Uh, we, we were friends with people in the community. Uh, we, were, we, had, I, we had contacted the, the what was it, Nice Matan newspaper, I think it's called. They came up and did a photo shoot of us, and, and it was a very positive article. So we had good connections. We, I, had, I had a good lawyer. I had a good printer. I had people that worked that were French that liked me. We paid our bills. Um, we, bought, we, bought, we bought a lot from the village we had. Um, when, when, I, when I bought the hotel and restaurant, the mayor owned a hotel and restaurant across the street. So I made sure to go there every once in a while to have lunch because I wanted to show that I want to support that hotel because it's the mayor's hotel. Well, at one point, 
I think one of the waiters or somebody came up and they didn't understand what the fuck I was doing there. They thought I was spying on them or something like that. And so they asked me, well, what do you do? How can you come here for lunch when you got a hotel? I said, I said, I said, look, I said, I said, you have much better trout than we do. They had this, they had this really good smoked trout, like a, 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 from the Normandy. It was delicious. And so I, I just joked with, them. I said, you got much better food than we do, you know? So, so it was a, it was a good, it was a good relationship. It was a good relationship. The only person in, in the village who didn't like us for some reason was the baker. We used to go down there and buy fresh bread every day and, the people from the kitchen came back and told me that that last time they were in there, the guy put a, a rifle on the on the on the on the, the counter, and they they backed off like this. I said, "Great!" I said, "Go to the village next to us and buy the bread for this guy." You know, so he lost a lot of business. The other guy made business. He was happy. Everybody was happy. He was the only guy that I, for some reason, was pissed off. Or I have no idea. But we had a good relationship with everybody. So, so once. Once we reopened, it was kind of like walking on eggs. And then, and then Sonny Tom and I left to go to, to, to the ranch. So, um, you know, we, again, we're, we're dressed in, you know, I got my French leather jacket on. <laughs> She's looking fine, you know. <laughs> Come on, we're Europeans. So we're going to the ranch. Well, I was familiar with that area. I'm, I was from San Francisco. I did a lot of hiking and backpacking when I was when I was younger. We'd go to we'd go up to Yosemite and go up to the, the Sierras, Cascades. We'd go up to Vancouver Island and down the coast. And I was I was familiar with Northern Oregon. I was familiar with all that whole area. Um, and what I knew about Oregon was very simple. If you go to Portland, it's relatively it's relatively liberal. It's a liberal town. Great people. If you go outside of Portland, what you find are a lot of a lot of very conservative people, Christian conservatives, gun-toting Christian conservatives, and um, and they're kind of like you know your redneck. They really are. They they tote guns in their cars and they got the funny hats on and they got the, the whole thing. And everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. So. We're flying into this place, and so we we take a bus, I guess, from Portland Airport, uh, airport up to up to uh, Antelope. Okay, so we stop in Antelope, and we're supposed to wait for the bus to come and get us to take us to the ranch. So we stop in this little diner for a cup of coffee. Again, we're we're dressed really well, you know, and I'm looking around town, and I see these sannyasins walking around. And they're kind of acting like assholes. They really were. I mean, I know this area. I know these people. Um, and maybe, maybe, maybe they weren't. Maybe they, it just seemed like they were being a little disrespectful people living there. And I could see the people living there. They had looks in their faces like they didn't like what was going on. You know? And I said to Sangha to him, I said, this doesn't look like it's working too well here. I said, I said, it doesn't look like a real happy group of human beings here all getting together, you know, all dancing together here. And so, you know, we get in the bus and we go to... The, so then we get off the bus and now we're walking in fucking dirt and dust and all like that stuff. And we got, we got nice shoes on. And, all kind of, and so I looked around and I said, I said, this is bullshit. I said, so, what the fuck, man? I'm out, the, I'm out in this dusty, shitty piece of land. So we stay, we stay. And so, so it turns out that, that two other people from Europe have been called there. Uh, 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 Varesh, who had a center up in, in Holland, who was a dear friend of mine. Unfortunately, he's passed away. And uh, my friend Semender, who had, a, uh, had an operation in, in, um, in England, and who was very kind to me when I first came back to, uh, to Europe. He kind of like, you can do this, Norm, or Pragit. And so, you know, we were all friends. So we were all called there. So, so they had this big festival. And Bhagwan's supposed to come out. We're all sitting there. So they put us up front, Okay. So it's me, Samendra, and Varesh. We're sitting up front. And I'm looking around like I'm a little embarrassed because I'm sitting up front. Everybody else is working their ass off on the ranch. And I come in with my f- fancy French clothes on. And I'm sitting up front. And Varesh and I and Varesh and I and Samendra are kind of looking at each other like, what the fuck is going on? And so he comes out and he, you know, he he does his thing and which is cool. Um, and then I get called to 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 I guess to meet with Bhagwan. And I walk in, I sit down, and the feeling I got, the sense I got was, he did not know who the fuck I was, okay? 
I just got to feel like, what's this guy's name again? You know, that kind of thing. And he was very nice to me. And I think he gave me some hat or something like that. I don't know. And so, you know, it was cool to see him and blah, blah, blah. And he was talking about my center and, oh, the center's open again. Oh, that's blah, blah, blah. And so it's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, like a you know, small talk. And so I left, but I didn't have that feeling I had in Pune. I didn't have that feeling I had in the Sangam. And then something happened that kind of put me over the edge. It's a weird story, but it happened. Three of my friends, three of my male friends, I mean, I'm talking about men friends, they want to talk to me. I said, okay. So they, we go off by ourselves, and they're looking around, and they're talking to me. And the word went out is that I'm supposed to clo- go back and close my center and, and, come, and come and move back. That's the word that went out. I don't know how, I don't know how that happened. I, I, I was told about it eventually, but the word went out. So these guys were in the impression that I'm going to go back to my center, close it down, and then come back and live on the ranch which I was not going to do. So these three guys, they got me in a, they got me off on the side there. And they say to me, Hey, Brigitte, he says, when you come back, could you bring us some fish hooks? I go, fish hooks? What the fuck you want fish hooks for? He says, well, we, we sneak off and go fishing, but it's hard. To, we can't go into town and get fish hooks. So if you can bring them back so we can go fishing. I looked at him. I said, wait a minute. I said, you were three grown men. I said, you sound like little bitches. I said, so you're three grown men. And you're asking me for fucking fish hooks? I said, go get your own goddamn fish hooks. I said, if you, got the, you don't have the balls to go buy your fish hooks and go, and go fish, then fuck you, you know? This is, not, this, is not, this is not Puna. This is bullshit. And the more I lived there, I mean, I saw people having a good time. There's no doubt about it. People were enjoying themselves. I mean, I'm, you know, and they were building a fucking town. It was amazing. I mean, they were doing amazing work. They really were. They were happy and they were driving the big trucks and they were doing all that kind of stuff. And so it was cool. Then the other thing that happened, which probably, I mean, if I had seen, if I had seen this, this wild, wild west thing, I wouldn't have said what I said. Sheila calls me to her trailer. Now, Sheila and I go back, we, we go way back. When I first got to Pune and I moved into the ashram, I lived right next door to Sheila. And she was married to, I think his name was Chimaya. He was the sweetest guy in the world, and he was, he was dying of cancer, but he was a sweet guy, and they were a nice couple, and she was a very sweet lady. Um, I thought she was a little crazy, I thought she was a little nuts, but most of us were a little crazy and a little nuts. So that, that was cool, but I liked her. She was cool, and we, were always, we always got along great. So she calls me to her run. So I figured, oh, I'm going to go see my old friend. She was great. So I walk in there, and she's got this pious look on my face. She looks like a Mormon. She's got this pious look on her face, like, hi, Brigitte. I go, hi. You know, I, I, go, I thought, what, what's up? And so she sits me down. And I'll never forget this. She takes my hand. She puts her hand over my hand. I go, what the fuck's going on? You know, she's hitting on me. And so she says to me, she says, look, pretty. And I look out the window. And there's this, like, this, this, this raw dirt land. You know, it's like dry, raw dirt. They call it the big muddy, for Christ's sake. And so she says, Brigitte, she says, this is paradise. Isn't this paradise, Brigitte? I go, that's not paradise. <laughs> you know, she's an old friend of mine. I thought she was taking... I said, no. I said, this is a, it's a shitty piece of land. And I started talking about this land. I mean, I know the land. I said, this is like... I mean, I couldn't find a worse place to, to go if I wanted to go build, build a fucking city, you know? And so I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, I mean, if I knew they were poisoning people, I wouldn't have said that. So, so then I leave... And now, now I, I, I think she's the one who says, here's what you need to do. You need to go back and close your center and move here. We want you to, we want you to come to the ranch. So I said yes to her because at that point, I was afraid to say no, to tell you the truth. Uh, it was just fucking weird there. Now, this is before they got the guns and the AR rifles and all that kind of stuff. If I had seen that, I would never have walked on the ranch in the first place because that's fucking out of sight. So... So, but it was still kind of weird. It was just kind of weird. And so, um, Sangi Tom and I, after two days, I guess it was, we got, in the, we got in the bus and left. And everybody's saying, oh, we can't wait to come back, Brigitte. It's going to be blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, great, great, great. And I hated to bullshit my friends, but I wasn't going to come back and I wasn't going to tell them I wasn't going to come back. So we got in the bus and once we got off the bus 
and into another bus, and we got to the airport, and we got on the airplane, and I looked at that song, and I was like, hey, we ain't going back there. She said, no way, you know, that was fucking bullshit. So we get back to the center, and um, and uh, and that's when, uh, oh, and then, another, then, then it happens again. Now, my... So again, I was told to keep it open. This goes back and forth. I mean, they're, I don't know, maybe they're fucking with me. But somehow they tell me to keep it open again. Okay. Now, before, before we left, before we left uh, uh, Oregon, I drove down to California to see my mom. And I, I heard rumors that, that Shiva, who I'd known for many, many years, uh, he was, he was in, we were in Pune together. And uh, uh, I like Shiva. She was a good man. We were very different, but he was a good man. He was an honest guy, and uh, I think he was a stand-up dude. So I heard that he left. So I found him, and we met at a restaurant halfway between San Francisco and wherever the hell he was. And he told me this horror story about what happened and why he left. He actually left. And I, I don't want to repeat the horror story, but it was a horrible story. And so then I'd also heard that my friend Diksha had been thrown out. Well, Diksha was one of my dearest friends. I mean, I mean, I totally trust Diksha. She's a good person. She's a damn good woman. And so when I got back to when I got back to my my, my center, uh, oh, I was told not to talk to Diksha. That's what they told me. He says, whatever you do, don't talk to Diksha. When somebody tells me not to talk to Diksha, I'm gonna fucking talk to Diksha. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that would I, mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't have talked to her ordinarily, but if you tell me not to, of course I'm gonna talk to her. So I get back to France. And of course, I, I go to the phone and I call Diction. And, uh, and she tells me some, you know, again, some horror stories about what's going on. And I trust her. So shortly after I talk to Diksha, I get a call from a roop from the, from the ranch. Asking me if I had talked to Diksha. I said, well, yeah, I talked to Diksha. She's a friend of mine. She says, well, you're out. And that's when I got kicked out. So I assume that whoever was spying in my center had found out I was talking to Diksha, called the ranch. So I figured this whole thing is messed up. So um, luckily I had some, some uh, traveling music, musician friends of mine who stop at my center all the time when they were going down to the, big, to the court d'Azur to play music and they were on their way back and they had a big truck and, and uh, they were, these German guys, I really loved them, they were great guys and they always stopped at my center and everybody liked them. So. Uh, I asked them, I said, would you guys get me the fuck out of here? They said, yeah, sure. So I packed up most of my belongings and put it in the back of their truck. And they drove me down to, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the Credit Lyonnais Bank. I saw Mr. Frattini, said goodbye, got my stash and split. <laughs> that was about it. Okay. So let me back up to kind of give you a sense, a better sense of this whole thing. My experience in Pune 1 and, and, and Europe, before I even started the center, and the center itself, was great experience. One of the best experiences I have in my life. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, the groups I did in Europe were amazing. They were fantastic because I had discovered through working with Bhagwan, through the dynamic meditations, through all the works we did, is the only thing I had to do with people is to put them in a room, put them through processes. Everything was existential. I didn't analyze them. I didn't tell them anything about themselves. I just put them through these processes. And if I could have people for three days, by the time they ended that group, they'd all be in love with each other. I, can, I could guarantee that with any 20 people. Put me, put me in a room with 20 people for three days. At the end, they're going to love each other. Just fucking easy because you... You, you get them out of their heads. You just get them out of your heads. Um, I mean, I, I remember I used, to live, I used to live in Aspen, and I used to mountain climb. And um, it's kind of the same feeling sitting on the top of a 14,000-foot peak, you know? You're out of your head. <laughs> or, or skiing backcountry. You get out of your head. It's very simple, but that's what we learned. And... The whole approach I had to therapy anyway was existential phenomenological, so this worked out fine. And uh, another thing that I want to go back and talk about um, that, 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 was, that was rich for me, and, and if anybody's listening to this that was there, thank you. Um, 
that when I was raised by a father, I mean, I was born in 1940. I was raised by a Jewish family. I was raised by my father to hate Germans, to literally hate Germans. He wouldn't allow my mother to buy anything made in Germany. We had a German doctor, but he was Jewish, okay? So Jewish Germans are okay, but not legit. Being in the ashram in Pune, it brought up an amazing amount of sadness because my father told me to hate, and I was there, and I was there, and I was learning to love. And I remember um, one of my dear German friends there. I was working on him one day. I was doing rolfing on him one day, and he was in a lot of pain, but it was good stuff, and he knew it. And so we left, and he walked to his room, and I walked to my room, and I started crying. And I realized that I loved this man, and he was German, and I was taught to hate Germans. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. So when I was in, I was in Europe, and I was doing group work. I was doing a lot of group work in Germany. There was a lot of there was a lot of centers in Germany, and so uh, again, I had this feeling of immense, amazing amount of love for the Germans. And what I what I realized was many of the Germans who came to the ashram had had. They had seen the horrors of what their parents and grandparents had done. And they were the opposite. They became very humanistic, very loving, just amazing people. And so just a shout out to all you people. Thank you for teaching me that. It's very rich. Anyway, so, um, so let's talk about the ranch right now and, and, and uh, this, um, this, this crazy movie. Uh, it was called, it was a wild, wild country. I think it was called, it should have been called Stupid, Stupid Country. Um, watching that, watching that, and watching Sheila, and watching that crazy fucking woman who, I mean, <laughs> okay, so you're, a, so you're a film photographer. Imagine you're doing a documentary film, and you get to do, you get to have the camera on a woman who's talking about how she tried to murder somebody. That's, that's gold. I bet they slapped hands after that one. You know, like, we, got, we got documentary gold, right? And, and to listen to what they did, uh, uh, spreading salmonella on a salad bar, you know? Unfucking believable uh, I mean, it's a- AR rifles? I mean, a... Uh, Assault rifles? They, they, somebody said in the thing that they had more assault rifles than, than the police had. I mean, that's, that's fucking nuts. I mean, it really went crazy. And to me, and, and to make a distinction here, to me, Puna 1, Sangam, my work in Europe, was humanistic. It was amazingly humanistic. It was about free self-expression, in personal freedom, uh, and, and, and community, love, respect, appreciation, all that sort of stuff. To me, the ranch was f- fascistic, totally fascistic. Uh, and, and, and it was, I mean, you know, uh, somebody joked one time that the uh, Nazis of consciousness. And it, it, it's a shame because that's, that's what happened. Now, But Juan was my master. He was a great master. But I think he's a shitty manager. I really do. And there's certain things that Bhagwan couldn't do. I mean, we, we look at your master, we go, he can do anything. But no, my, I mean, my son Sam was a point guard for his basketball team. I'm sure, you know, Sam was a better three-point shot than Bhagwan. You know, I, I could ski better than Bhagwan. Um, people at the ashram played music better than Bhagwan. Uh, uh, he was basically uncoordinated. I, I remember he had, used to wear a towel, and one day he threw the towel away, and it looked like an idiot trying to throw it. So, you know, he was a great master, but there's certain th- things he fucking couldn't do. And one of them, he can't run a goddamn business, that's for sure. And he has no idea how, how to manage people. Any businessman knows that you don't hire yes people. Simple. You never hire yes people. And that's what he did. He just hired a bunch of yes people. So, you know, I don't know where the fault lies, but the whole thing was fucking dumb. And, and I think a lot of it falls on Bhagwan. He was in charge of this. He was the CEO. He was the, he was the head of the organization. And people who came there came for Bhagwan. They came to 
because they loved Bhagwan and they were sannyasins, they were disciples of Bhagwan. Now granted, there's this whole Gurjifian thing where you dig a hole and then fill it up and dig a hole and fill it up until you realize that you shouldn't be attached to the hole and all kind of shit. And I'm sure that they're, 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 so, he, so either he did one or two things. Either he tried to create a city and fucked up, or he went in with the idea that he was going to build it up and then blow it up. Right? So either one of those two things has got to happen. There's no other explanation for it. Either he fucked up completely, he, hired the, he had these idiots run the place, they didn't know what the fuck they were doing, I don't, oh no, let's, let's drill down here. Okay, so you go, into, you, go into, you go into northern Oregon, which is conservative, right-wing, religious, uh, Christian religious, and, you know, basically people that don't want anybody to fuck with them, okay? Which is cool. You buy this big piece of rant, this big rant called the Big Muddy, and then you tell them that you're, it's going to be, a, a, you get an agricultural permit to run. It's going to be, you know, something about agriculture. And then you, you say you have a religion. So, it's a, so people, think it's, people think it's a religion. And then you got these people coming dressed in red with these malas hanging around their neck. And... Didn't anybody ever tell him about Jonestown? Come on, man. And then, and then even, even, even after that, they had all this money. You don't hire a PR firm. You don't try to get along with the people there. Like Antelope had, what, 60 some, some, some solid people in it, right? You can't get along with 60 people. You can't, you can't schmooze Run the con, do whatever you want on 60 fucking people. Treat them like human beings. For instance, I think Madras is like, what, 30 some odd miles away with, with the closest hospital? Madras. Huh? Madras. Madras. Madras, excuse me. Madras. Yeah. What the fuck I'm talking about? My grandma's from there. Oh, his grandma's from there. Good. <laughs> Say hello to your grandma. Anyway, so, so, so Madras, like the hospital there is what, 30, 30 some odd miles away? The ranch was closer. Why couldn't they offer health services to these people? Why couldn't they come in and do Meals on Wheels or, or serve these people somehow? You know, why, why can't you get along, so to speak? Instead of establishing the sannyasin ego, hello, the sannyasin ego where we're better than you. And that's what kind of came out in the film, that there was this arrogance about these motherfuckers. They're, they were building a city. Oh, yeah, well, good luck. Look what happened. And then... And then the, the whole idea of, of bussing in these poor homeless people. I mean, a lot of these guys were men. I saw the pictures, these men. And a lot of those homeless guys were guys that came back from Vietnam with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And these are, not to, these are not people to fuck with. They've already been fucked with. They've already been in goddamn Vietnam, a shitty war that we should never have been in. And they come back to a country that doesn't like them. And all of a sudden, they have, oh, there's a chance. I get to go to this great place. They get drugged, and then they throw them out. That alone is fucking bullshit. You know, that is fucking bullshit. And that pissed me off. That really fucking pissed me off. I think of all the things that pissed me off most about the goddamn, you know, wild, wild country was that. You know, to treat those men like that. That's, that's, that's criminal. Well, it's obviously criminal. And then, you know, I'm going to talk about Naren. Because I used to be a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer. Uh, I was raised with lawyers. I practiced law for five years. I was a trial attorney. Um, and, you know, I don't know Naren, but he sounds like a really sharp guy. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I have a lot of respect for him. But I also had a lot of empathy for this man. Because a, a lawyer is supposed to be in control of his client. Okay? You hire a lawyer, and you listen to the lawyer. You do what the lawyer tells you. Otherwise, why the fuck have a lawyer? Well, here's he's got a lawyer that he's a disciple of. Excuse me, he's got a, he's got a client that he's a disciple of. And then 
he has to listen to crazy Sheila. And here's this poor guy <laughs> trying to practice law in a red suit and a red tie. Okay. And you've got, you've got all different types of law that he, that these guys had, had, had to deal with. You know, you have immigration law, you have real estate law, you have corporate law, you have tax law. I mean, and, and then, and then they got this whole group of, of, of lawyers there. Okay. Yet no one had the intelligence to buy a shredder. Okay. Seriously. So you got these confidential documents. They're thrown in the garbage. The little fat guy lives next door to him. He comes and gets them from the garbage, gives them the authorities. And that's basically, from what I understand, you know, one of the cards in the house, in the, in the, in the stack of cards that came out that made the cards fall down. <laughs> you didn't think of shredding confidential information written on a piece of paper and then just throw it in the garbage? Come on, man. And then, and then uh, uh, yeah, let's talk about federal, federal court, okay? I've, I've been in federal court. If you're a lawyer and you walk into federal court with a red suit and a red tie, the judge will probably find you in contempt of court. Okay. Now, maybe he didn't do that, but that's what I saw in the video. He's got this red suit and red tie. So the whole thing looked like ludicrous to me. And with all due respect, Naren, I mean, I, I mean, you must have had a hard time at it, but you know, the only thing I didn't like about the wild, wild country. And I thought they did a good job. No kidding. I, think that I thought those guys did a hell of a job for a documentary. But the thing I was upset about is that they basically had these crazy ladies on there. And then you've got this, this poor lawyer in a red suit and a red tie. <laughs> and then you got this fink. And that's basically who they, who they have on. It's too bad they didn't take time to interview some of the really intelligent sannyasins who were there, who were there because they love the community, they love each other. They were working hard to create this, 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 this city. Um, they worked every day, they, they, they played, they danced, they were good people. I'm sorry that, that they didn't get, they didn't get that, 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 that type of interview. Uh, I think that was missing. My friend just, Jason just asked me, um, after they closed me down in, in, in Sangam, did I ever think of just running it myself and keep it going? And um, the first time that Sushila came and told us to close down, um, there was a woman in my center uh, whose father was a rich businessman. And uh, he had come up to visit the center and he and I got along great. Uh, in fact, uh, um, I grew to really love this man. And um, unfortunately, he's passed away, but he's a beautiful man. And so uh, when he heard about the thing closing down, he called me down to uh, meet him in, uh, I think it was Nice or Khan, I forgot where. And we're sitting out in this beautiful, you know, restaurant overlooking the, the water there. And, and you know, he's, t he's talking to me and he basically offered me, he offers me money to keep Sangan open. And he, you know, he was a multi, multi, multi millionaire, a very, very rich man. And he, because he liked what I was doing. And uh, I believed him. He was an honest man. And there was no reason he would bullshit me. And I remember what I said to him. I said to him, I said, Morris, I said, if you knew the emotional state I was in right now, if you, if you could understand somehow the emotional state I'm right now, you wouldn't offer me that money. And so that was the end of that. So um, obviously sometimes I've had remorse or re regret that I didn't have the, the emotional strength to accept his offer and keep it going. But you know, that's the way it goes. Okay, there's something else I wanna add about Puna One and I think that's missing in this, in the documentary. And that's the incredible amount of humor that we had in those days and Bhagwan, uh, uh, he was actually very funny. Um, I remember one time um, uh, he he did this. Uh, somebody somebody complained about him swearing. One of the Indian sannyasins complained about him swearing. He used, I think, the word shit or fuck or something like that. 
And so uh, as a result of this man complaining, he did the famous fuck lecture. And you can find it. I'm sure it's, it's still out there somewhere because it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. My friend Govin was sitting next to me and he actually rolled over on his side from a cross-legged position because it was so funny. And I think he said fuck maybe 20 times or something like that. I'm not sure how many times. And then, um, and then I think, uh, 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 oh yeah, this one sannyasin, um, early on, uh, he got, Bhagavan gave him a name that the guy didn't like. And so Lakshmi heard about the fact that the guy didn't like his name. She told Bhagavan, Bhagavan called him back. He said, so you don't like your name? He says, no, I don't. He says, okay, I'll give you a better name. So he called him uh, uh, Krishna Christ. Or Christ. Yeah, Krishna Christ. And so, so he, that was his name, Krishna Christ. So he called himself, I think, KC after that because it was embarrassing for him. Yeah, and, and then I remember, oh yeah, I remember one time I was, I was, uh, I was guarding at, at a darshan and um, this little French guy walks in and he's like this French hippie and he's got, he's got the armbands, he's got the band around his head and he's got all this stuff on him. And, and, and so he takes sannyas and Bhagwan's very nice to him. And so he, 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 he says to Bhagwan, he says, Bhagwan, he says, I feel like I'm a healer. I think I'm a healer. I think I have healing powers in my hand. Bhagwan, am I a healer? And Bhagwan just looks at him and goes, no. He says, have him work in the kitchen. <laughs> and so the next day you see this guy cutting tomatoes, right? <laughs> the great healer. So he had a good sense of humor. I mean, he, he, okay, so he named me Pragit, okay? And then he, and he named my friend uh, Pragat, okay? So when I was there, I was six foot two, about 185 pounds. And Pergan was the next football player. He used to play for the, uh, uh, for the Buffalo Bills. Big dude. So he named, he named me Pergeet and he named him Pergan. They both named the same thing. Little song. It's a joke. Come on, it's a joke. Then same thing. Uh, oh yeah, there was a guy in, there named Siddharji. Many of you remember, remember him. He was a great, great old guy. He was, a, he was an Indian Sikh, I believe. And he was a disciple of, of Bhagwan's. And he was real loud. And he laughed really loud. And so some, so he was a lecturer and he was laughing really loud. So India, some Indian sannyasin complained about, he was laughing too loud. It was upsetting his meditation. And so Bhagwan gave this long lecture about how he loved Siddhartha, Siddharji's laugh and how beautiful it was and blah, blah, blah. Laughter is the singing of the soul. He goes on and on about this thing, as I remember. And then, and then he had him lead a, a laughing meditation every morning. And I think he sent this Indian sannyasin to do a laughing meditation. Um, there was, there was, there was, you know, there were a lot of them. I mean, there was just, it was, he was funny. He was, he was warm. He was kind. He was funny. He had a, 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 a great sense of people. I remember one time I was guarding and this woman came to him. She was a, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 year old woman from, um, from Holland. And she was telling Bhagwan how, you know, She'd lost her husband and her children had grown up and moved out and she was all alone and she was just going on about how bad her life was. And Bhagwan looks at her and he gets all bright. He says, this is very good. This is very good. He says, now you have chance to work on yourself. You have chance to, and he's going on like this. And I could just watch the woman's body. Her body started changing and she just looked at him with a beaming eyes and looked at her smiling like that, you know? He had her change like one, one minute. Uh, Another man I knew, uh, um, he had been a he had been a junkie for I think seventeen years. He said I forgot how many, and he told me that Bhagwan saved his life. So there was a lot of people there that Bhagwan really served, me included. And I think that was the for me that was the power of Puna One is the difference we made in human beings' lives. You know, I really think that that that's the reason one of the reasons that kept us there because we were we were making a difference. Okay, so in closing, I mean, I hope I haven't upset people too much. Um, I have a tendency to do that. That was my job. I ran encounter groups. Um, and, you know, I, I, I look back on it. I look back on my life and the best parts of my life is having made a difference in somebody else's life. And I mean that sincerely. Um, I, I feel good about the work I did. And I'm sure I upset some people and I'm sure I offended people and I, and. I, maybe I even hurt people, and I'm sorry. I apologize for that. I'm very sorry for that. Um, I'm a diff, obviously a different person now. Um, 
I, I also would like to say something else, and that is that um, what I, when I was talking about Bhagwan, I, it's what I heard him say. And I think we all have heard him say things. And uh, who knows whether he actually said it or not, but I heard him say. So, so I'd, like to, I'd like to qualify everything I said was that I heard him say that. I remember one time um, I was guarding outside of, of the lecture hall. And right after lecture, these, these group of Italian people were standing right next to me. And I was just sitting there. And one Italian guy says to them, I can't do an Italian accent, but really says, he says, isn't that a beautiful what a Bhagwan is saying? He said, he said it's, it's not a mystery, to, he said, it's not a problem to be solved, it's a misery to be lived. And he had changed the word mystery to misery within like 15 minutes. So imagine, you know, what, 30 years, 40 years later, I might be screwing the whole thing up, but, so I apologize for that. But I, it's what I heard Bhagwan say, basically. Um, and the other thing, too, is like, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to just acknowledge my friend Diksha. Um, I was hoping she would do this with me, but she's so busy going to see people. You know, she runs around seeing people all the time. And uh, my dear friend Ashish is not doing well right now. And, you know, she flew over to Italy to see him. That's who she is. When Lakshmi was dying, Diksha went there and I was able to talk to Lakshmi and say goodbye. So thank you, sweetheart. Love you. Um, and um, yeah, uh, loved all you. Bye.